when I tasted the food that I grew, it tasted way better than the stuff in the grocery store. So much of what you get in the grocery store is hydroponic and it really doesn't taste like that much. Uh, so real soil grown, organic food tastes so good. And I really wanted to share that with people who didn't have the capacity like I did at the time. So I started the CSA program because I thought it was super cool. I love the CSA concept. People would just come to the farm with their bags and their kids and they would pick up their box. Yeah, it's so good. And it's turned into a viable yeah. business. We have three delivery drivers. We have an office team that does sales and marketing and customer service. And then we have the pack team that's dealing with all of the produce from this farm and our partner farms, custom making everyone's order and making sure it's food safe and gets packed correctly and on time every single day. And then we have the production team making veggies all the time. Those are the people you see in the fields and on tractors and some of them are building their greenhouses <laughs> right now. We actually transitioned our CSA to have uh, perennial shares. We have perennial CSA members and their shares never end, technically. They come back year after year, week after week, and so they just end when the customer wants it to end. That has really helped stabilize our business, our cash flow, our customer base. It's really changed how a lot of people eat because they're constantly eating local and so they're getting to be really really in tune with what's ripe in the mid-atlantic at any time of year and that's that's really special it's um it's pushed people's culinary creativity we are selling staple and specialty food yeah. you know we want people to get our you know orange carrots and gold potatoes from us and at the same time we want to keep life fun and interesting and new and fresh and special. When I was pregnant with my firstborn, I was really passionate about providing healthy produce for my growing fetus. The what to expect when you're expecting book said arugula it was really good for baby brain development because it has the DHA vitamins and fish does too, but then they're also like, don't eat fish. So I started buying like tons of bags of arugula. And then I blew my grocery budget. The seeds were only a couple dollars. So I built myself a salad table. I screwed together this little like raised beds on uh, saw horses. <laughs> I stuck it on my apartment balcony and put arugula seeds in there. And that was the beginning of my love for growing things. I started in my parents' backyard in Baltimore County, a half acre of, you know, essentially bartered land. I didn't have any experience farming. I didn't have more than $200 to invest in literal seed money. I had two kids under two. And then it's big. It's big? Okay, can you pull that one? Ooh, what color is that one? Purple. Someone likes to pick her own strawberries. Mm. I uh, took a 12 member CSA program for about like a 20 week season. Since then, which was uh, 2012, I've just grown the business slowly. I started bartering for more pieces of property. I had um, ultimately by 2019, I had six pieces of borrowed land. I got them all certified organic, which was kind of crazy because each piece had to have its own organic system plan. 15 acres is kind of a lot, um, especially because uh, all of this equipment, I was hauling it around. It was painfully inefficient. And at the same time, I didn't have a mortgage. It was all barter for veggies. So I was able to grow my business pretty substantially, which without taking on a mortgage. And I had the benefit of having experience at that point on six different parcels of land. So I got a really good understanding of what I really needed before I made this giant investment of buying land. So in late 2019, I purchased this land, which is 25 acres in Frederick County. The benefit of having my own land was the ability to invest in infrastructure. That's the one thing I wasn't able to do on barter land. I tried, I asked. 
We grow crops in two different ways. We direct sow them into the ground and we transplant them. With transplants, we can really get a jump on the season and the weeds and really disease as well and pest pressure by keeping them in a controlled environment before we put them in the ground. In the case of peppers, they need a bunch of weeks in the greenhouse before we can take them um, outside for transplant. They're heat loving crops and we can really uh, get a jump start on the harvest by starting them inside. So we do have actually start all our seeds in here. We have a germination chamber that puts the seedlings at the correct temperature so that we get really good germination. And then uh, we grow them out in here. These are all our peppers. We have a bunch of different kinds of herbs here. Um, you can see this um, fancy kind of basil. This is that purple. Um, we've got cilantro and lettuces and a bunch of brassicas. So we're growing uh, an array of specialty crops here. I like to say specialty is our specialty. This is our water wheel transplanter. These get filled with water and also some fertilizer. All of those trays that you saw in the greenhouse sit here and up here and here. And then we have riders. So when you're riding this, you can take a transplant from here and put it directly into the ground because those two wheels actually create dibbles and the water and the fertilizer fills into that. And then we put the seedlings directly in the ground. This is Slayer for slaying weeds. It's a really cool tractor. It's fun to drive because it's light and fast. So the faster you go, the better it'll slay. I used to do every job on the farm myself and now I've developed a lot of systems and my staff is really capable to take them on. That's a mushroom compost that we get from farms in Pennsylvania. I don't know if you know that Pennsylvania is the mushroom capital of the world. <laughs> All of our equipment is set up for this bed system. So all the tractors have the same tire width so that they fit on either side of this bed, which means that we can not only prep the soil, put the compost, put the nutrients, create a bed, transplant, but then we can also cultivate. Are you able to reuse a lot of this plastic? No. Okay. That's frustrating. It is. So we have drip irrigation underneath these and it's a way for us to conserve water because otherwise we're um, overhead watering. That's subject to evaporation, especially on a really windy day. Uh, the, the top layer of soil is going to evaporate really quickly yeah. and you'll just have to keep watering and watering. But here, if we water with drip irrigation, which is buried underneath the soil and then protected by this plastic, even if you give it a little bit of water, it stays really moist in there. Like imagine a wet paper towel in a plastic bag. It would stay wet for a while. Even though I don't love plastic, it's, it's not my favorite thing at all. It makes economical sense and in some ways environmental sense. Both conventional and organic vegetable operations use plastic mulch. Some don't use any, of course. Um, it really depends on the scale and the microclimate. Right now, the National Organic Program does not allow biodegradable plastics to be used on an organic operation. So we do have to remove them each year and throw them away in order to keep our organic certification. certification yeah. Because who knows what other additives might be in the... What might be breaking down over time, yeah. We have an apiary here. They are fantastic. They pollinate our crops. And so they help us get better yields because more of the flowers are pollinated. It is owned and operated by Chesapeake Queen Company. They've been working day and night on creating new boxes and making splits. And they're also catching swarms in the area. Brian's all, I'm gonna screw up. And then he's like, no, nah, I got Grant, I'm gonna show up. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not Swarms are really, really docile. So even though there's bees all over you, you can just walk right into them and they're not gonna sting you because bees only sting to protect their house. But when they're swarming, they're looking for a new home. That is a purple martin house. Purple martins are beneficial birds for us because they eat a ton of insects. It's so fun. I love these birds. Uh, we actually have three purple martin houses on the property. We also have some bat houses and some of those native bee homes as well. We don't only want our pollinators to be our honeybees, even though we love them. We do want to create a habitat for our local pollinators as well.
I have a multi-prong plan for climate resilience. One of the reasons that I collaborate with other farmers is to develop resilience. By banding together, we can have more bounty available in the winter, which will keep our customers. I started selling to restaurants in 2013, which was the year after I started the CSA program. And I realized pretty quickly that customer retention was gonna be really hard with chefs if I stopped selling to them in the winter. It felt like a real problem and it was much harder to get those customers back when I was re-announced myself every May. <laughs> like, hey, here I am, come, you know, buy my stuff. And they're like, oh, we've been using produce all yeah. winter. Even though I could grow a lot of turnips and storage radishes, it's only so interesting <laughs> week after week. But if I could pair that with my taki mushrooms and you know candy carrots, then it really rounded it out and we really helped each other out. A lot of those farms that I aggregate from are market farmers. And if they have a bad week or if their market is seasonal, it's really helpful for them to have year round sales. The other thing for me is that as a business owner, I really wanted an income year round, but it was also my employees. Yeah. And if I don't have income in the winter, I can't keep them on. And that means it's not only customer acquisition that I'm struggling with in the winter, but it's employee retention and then training them at the time of year like this is really stressful. We also invest in our soil. That's a really big one. By treating our soil like it is the key to human survival, which it very much is, and that does require a long-term approach. We're able to weather harsher conditions by investing in organic matter and all of the different nutrients that the soil needs um, to really increase its ability to hold and drain water. It's one of the most important things I feel like I'm doing, taking conventional land and regeneratively farming it and nurturing it back organically is not easy. And that's the situation this planet is in. Somebody's gotta roll up the sleeves and do the hard work. And that is farmers creating a really resilient food system based on our local economy is how we're gonna thrive in a time of climate change. I just don't see global pandemics and supply chain disruptions and wars or political strife putting us in the situation where we should be continually relying on international or you know across the nation food for our daily subsistence. Now that we're several seasons in and actually acquiring more land. Um, so we're on 25 acres, but this year we're actually gonna be on 40 acres and next year we're gonna be on 70. It's been really great to employ people and farm alongside of other people. It's a really hard job. And so it's nice to share your successes and challenges with others. So this is French swirl. It tastes like a green apple. Oh, wow. <laughs> Very sour. <laughs> oh, it's really good. Mm -hmm. so, wow, that's amazing. Mm -hmm.